Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Utah Story Show. My name is Richard Marcosian. On our program today, we have a very exciting guest, a farmer, fifth-generation Mormon pioneer farmer, Lyle Christensen. I really enjoyed how he ties in his agricultural interest in farming background to his Mormon pioneer past. I also come from Mormon pioneer heritage, and I'm proud of that. Um, I'm not a practicing member because I like beer and I like to drink it, but I'm very proud of my Mormon heritage, and I believe Brigham Young had a brewery, so I don't think Brigham would be looking down upon me for drinking beer, just to say that. So Lyle is trying to obtain one of the 10. There's just 10 medical marijuana grow permits in all of Utah, and Lyle is trying to get one of them. And what I found out is that most of the permits are very likely to go to giant, big corporate agri-growers from other states. And the problem with this is that there is going to be a giant windfall fall of profits when medical cannabis is finally rolled out in Utah and the thousands and thousands of patients are served. And if all those profits are going outside of Utah, we kind of think that might not be such a good thing. So Lyle and I have a conversation about that, and we will talk about a lot of different things concerning um, how Utah and our policymakers and our economy has kind of gone off the rails in terms of our ability to support local farmers, local industrious people, really what the original vision of the pioneers had when they came to this valley. It was all about creating self-reliant communities and creating um, hard-working little cottage industries that people could work in to be more self-reliant and not so reliant on big moneyed corporate interests. So Lyle and I go into that. It's a very fun conversation. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed recording it. Without further ado, Lyle Christensen. Right, Lyle Christensen, the Viking farmer. Welcome to the Utah Story Show. Oh, thank you for inviting me over here. I'm excited to be here. I'm super excited to have you on because this whole time I've been covering cannabis in Utah and Proposition 2, I felt like the voice that was missing was the Utah farmer. And when you showed up to that meeting, I was like, yes, this is exactly what we need to yeah. add to this whole conversation because... Um, I just don't think that the small entrepreneurial farmer has been out there. And why do you think that is? There hasn't been any farmers really coming forward besides you that I know of yeah. talking about cannabis and growing it. Well, I think there's several reasons why. Uh, one of them is because uh, the average age of a farmer in the United States is 59. And what, 4% of farmers are under the age of 35. So I, I fit a very small demographic yeah. of, of farmers. In, in the group of farmers, I'm a very small demographic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think most of the older farmers, one, they found, you know, that's, you know, $100,000 just to apply or, you know, to get the license. So there's already all this money that goes into it. You know, there's a lot of initial investment you have to make. And I think a lot of farmers, especially what I've seen in my family, is, you know, the older farmers... Uh, they're much more skeptical about new things, or they're very. They can become very skeptical about, uh, you know, lawyers and suits and and big corporations and things like that. And you know, those are the people who are coming in and applying for these. Mm -hmm. And so, me being a small farmer and a fifth generation farmer, uh, I wanted to be the voice of the voiceless. Yeah. And I know that there are farmers that have shown interest, but for several, you know, for whatever reasons, they've decided not to pursue, or they're they're worried about that, and it's. And the thing for me is just I want to make I want to you know make my voice heard. So when yeah. we were at the hearing, they tell you you know state your name, the company you're from, and you know what what you represent. And I'm Lyle Christensen. I'm, I'm a fifth generation farmer, and I represent all other Centennial farmers here in the state of Utah. That's awesome. And that's that's how I wanted to to bring that. At, you know that's why I wanted to bring the table at that hearing. Yeah, and I and I've um, I just got to tell you a little background. So we were at the Department of Agriculture for a different meeting to meet with Utah Zone, and I'm sitting there and I'm watching all these guys in suits and these ladies dressed up, 
um, go up to that second level, and I'm like, now wait a minute, the Bar- Department of Agriculture and people in suits and ties, looking like they have a lot of money going upstairs, that just like did not equate. And so, has it been a weird forum for you to be sort of the rebel farmer who's in this with this these people who are moneyed interests? I think mostly from big cannabis from other states coming in and trying to compete at that level? I would say yes and no for several reasons. So yes, in the sense that, you know, I'm a fifth generation farmer. Uh, You know, I showed up there, a lot of people in suits and it's, you know, I gravitate towards old farmers, like, you know, like my dad or my uncles or whatever, other farmers I interact with. And that's the thing is it's a lot of them. They're always excited to see young blood and, you know, in the scene. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I studied uh, business strategy at BYU. I was recruited to Fortune 50 Corporation right out of college. Uh, I had also worked for you know several large companies, and so I've, I'm not afraid of suits or I'm not afraid of big companies. I worked for you know for a really large one at one point, so in wow. that sense, it doesn't. I'm not intimidated by anything. So tell me more about your background. So you. You went to BYU and then you yep. you you went and lived back east. Did you say? Uh, yeah. So uh, I actually I originally went to Utah State for a semester, but I decided I wanted to be closer to home so I could take care of the farm. My dad was my dad's getting was getting older, and it actually worked out uh, really well in that sense because my dad got sick my first year of college, and so that three weeks into my first semester at BYU. Uh, my dad he uh, he was diagnosed with colon cancer, and he's just like. We got 150 acres, about 80 hay of cattle, and you're in charge. Here's here are the reins, you know. Jeez. And for you know that that first year of college, I worked full time and I went to school full time, and I had very little free time. But you know, I, I was able to make ends meet and make everything work, and it was a, it was a great opportunity to kind of rise to the occasion and, and make things work. Cool. And so, wow. you know, I studied. I uh, so I, at BYU, I studied strategy. I uh, lived in Iceland for a summer. Uh, lived with, I studied University of Reykjavik, and then I lived with my relatives uh, in the Westman Islands for a couple months. And you know, I met the president of Iceland, the parliament. Uh, I learned Icelandic as well, so I'm a polyglot. So I lived. I, I had served a mission in Sweden, but I was a Spanish-speaking missionary in wow. Stockholm. So, so was, that's where you get the Viking farmer. Yeah, you, you so, do have deep connections with well, Iceland. Not, not only I served a mission in Sweden, but you know, I am Scandinavian. So my great great grandparents come from Iceland and Denmark. And those are two countries I've been to. I speak Icelandic, I speak Swedish. Uh, I also study Norwegian as well. Wow. And so in that sense, I do consider myself a Viking of sorts. Nice. And then I'm also a farmer, you know, fifth generation farmer from Spanish Fork, Utah. And for many who don't know, uh, Spanish Fork, Utah is the first Icelandic settlement in North America. And that was from the saints who, uh, and those pioneers who, you know, took a 300 day trek from the Westman Islands in Iceland to the Utah Valley. Nice. So I'm one of those descendants. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this, I'm the new age of Vikings, so. And so where, where did you go back east to work and what did you do back there? Well... I guess before, so before I actually went back east, I lived in Venezuela for a summer. I uh, worked, uh, I did accounting for uh, a man who did, who had several different uh, stores in what, like the largest, uh, the largest mall in South America, Sambil was what his name was. And so anyways, I, I worked there, did accounting for him for a little while and just wanted to live in Venezuela. I had a lot of friends from there when I was in college. And so they helped me get an internship. I did that. And then I was recruited to Sears Holdings and their toys department. Uh, <laughs> is the beginning of my senior year, they were still they were there, a Fortune 50 company. So this was 2009. I'd gotten that job offer, and I just you know signed my signed away for that. And it was a great opportunity. Uh, you know, beginning of my senior year, I already had my job offer, and then I went there, and uh, I was able to learn a lot with uh, analytics. Uh, getting, I got really good at Excel. Started learning how to do uh, database querying and uh, a lot of analytics yeah and so i did that for about a year and then i uh i moved out to uh, boston because i kind of wanted something a little i wanted to work for a much smaller company i kind of realized you know byu they always want you to they always say like you need to go to a big you know big company and work that put in a few years and then get your mba you know at at harvard or something like that you know and do all these great things and i kind of realized that the corporate life wasn't 
it mm-hmm. wasn't what I wanted. So I worked for a much smaller company. It was a maid service franchise based out of uh, Boston called Made Pro. And they have about 250 locations around the U.S. and Canada. And so I was originally marketing there, marketing consulting. Mm-hmm. And I would create be- benchmark analyses to find out which offices were doing well and which ones weren't. And then we would consult with the ones who needed uh, who needed some improvements. And then I was later in BI there. And over the years, every summer, I'd come back and, and do second crop pay with my dad. I'd come back for Christmas and play around on the tractors. And over those next four years, I... Uh, you know, it became my, my, my reality became more and more of the farm and less of living in Boston. So I decided to move home. Huh. And how many years ago was that? That was, uh, December, 2015. Yeah. So I, uh, did route 66 and traveled around a bunch and I did a lot of traveling. And then that spring I, I farmed a bunch. And then that fall, I, uh, I got a, I took a job for a company called NAV. It's a, a tech startup based out of Draper mm-hmm. and I'm in their business intelligence department. And so, I do a lot of analytics, a lot of visual visualizations through Tableau and SQL querying. And it's kind of, it's, I, I like to think of it almost like a, a data architect in some ways. You have to think of it like we get all this random data. It's like all these random Legos. Mm-hmm. And what I do is I compartmentalize them, you know, into different colors and different sections. And I want to make pirate ships. Well, I'm like, okay, I'll make a hole here. I'll make these other parts. And so I get all this raw data, clean it up, and I'm able to make it so it's easily digestible. And, uh, you're able to uh, get the right analytics and the right uh, callouts for whatever you know, oh, your so marketing you're, you're a are. data scientist farmer. Yeah, I have I have dabbled in data science as well, but we have a we have a data science team. Of these some of these guys are just insanely smart, and it's you know I, I felt like I was a pretty good data scientist at one point. You know, doing a few different types of uh, uh, a few different analyses. And seeing some of the data scientists in my work, I'm like, wow, it's, you don't realize how little you know until you, you, know, you, yeah. you see someone who's really an expert in the field. But it's yeah. so exciting to do. So Yeah, well, my wife, my wife was a physicist at Cambridge University in England. And, oh, wow. And she was studying how to use the data that she was getting from her, all of her tests and results to basically drive the program forward and and so that was something that she learned and something i respect a lot because it's yeah. it's all about the data these days that's every, true every meeting i go to i say that to, to yeah. potential advertisers you got to know your data yeah i agree so you wh- have you have you been able to use your corporate skills and that whole skill set to improve your farm and your operations and everything you do oh yeah i i believe so uh i think Part of that, aside from that, though, is uh, just being generally passionate about something. When when uh, when you're passionate, you always want to find ways to improve or get better. And so for, when I decided to move home, I wanted to have certified weed-free alfalfa. I wanted to grow the very best stuff out there. So I started going to hay conferences every year. So I went to Burley, Idaho. I was, I'm a member of the Idaho Hay and Forage Association. I'm also a member of the California Alfalfa and Forage Association. And so every year, you know, I go to Burley or I go to Reno and uh, learn more about, you know, how to improve my crops. And so a lot of it is almost like being a, you know, a kind of a, a scientist where I, I, you know, try new different, you know, new ways to fertilize my fields, new ways to improve my crops. And, you know, it's just all experimentation. But, you know, it also has helped knowing how to, how to budget and how to, uh, you know, use Excel and kind of scale numbers and, and things like that. And so that has helped me as well. But I think not as much of my analytics, but just, uh, for example, at BYU, when I studied strategy, we did a lot of business cases where we would find out why some businesses failed and, and some were successful and because they had different types of strategies. And so uh, I, when I was at a hay conference, somebody had mentioned to me, he's like, you know, like you have a really good hay, but you have a really small, you know, a small amount because I only have about 80 acres of land, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, you should try to go into like something else, like selling small increments. And so I just went on Amazon. I typed down alfalfa hay, and I found a few people and bought all their hay or whatever, and checked it out a week later, you know, a few days later when I got back. And it wasn't. I'm like, this hay is it's okay, but it's not nearly as good as mine is because all my hay is lab tested. I soil test my fields. I do multiple fertilizer applications. I make compost teas. I put compost. I, I I use Mother Nature. That's my secret weapon. Is it organic hay? Yeah, uh, it's not organic, mm-hmm. uh, but I use a lot of organic practices. I, I would say mm-hmm. I'm a, I'm a I'm a wannabe organic farmer right now, and mm-hmm. so that's what also excites me about about the cannabis industry and growing uh, medical cannabis. Just mm-hmm. from the people I've uh, 
I've been uh, working with. I actually have a business partner who is, who is a uh, medicinal cannabis grower in California. Oh, okay. Uh, another a, another local from Salem, Utah. Uh, she and I went to uh, school together. We known each other for years and years, and uh, we reconnected recently. And and she was an organic farmer, and so she and I talk about you know all sorts of different things that we want to do. I talk about you know vermicompost and bokashi. You know, which is a type of it's a fermenting process of compost and she talks to me all all sorts of organic farming and like whatever she says i'm just like yeah hallelujah nice. let's do this and so <laughs> it's really fun it's really great to find somebody else who's passionate about organic farming and farming in general and it is not i'm a, into I'm something a big money. time compost geek so i love to hear about compost oh yeah dr elaine ingham and her teachings about com- compost and have you have you heard have you heard of her before? No, I'll have to I'll yeah, have to read to her, her up. She's she teaches all about how to create compost tea and ideal compost piles and yep. things like that. And yeah, I just put some compost tea out just uh, two three days ago. So. Yeah, that's cool. So you you plan on um, how many acres will you devote to the medical cannabis if you if you're lucky enough all to get four a acres, four so. acres. Yeah, that's the yeah. maximum you can have is four acres. So yeah. Might as well grow four acres. I've got plenty of land, so. Yeah, and are you not interested in industrial hemp? Um, I am in- interested in industrial hemp, but I just see this medical cannabis license as such uh, such a great opportunity. If I didn't, if I did not apply to it, apply for it, I feel like I would regret it in the future, and so mm-hmm. that's uh, you know why that's why I want to apply for it and. You know, it was when I first got the RFP, I, my, I remember my stomach just sunk, just looking at all the paperwork and all the things I got to do. And I'm like, you know, if, if I had six months, you know, like they originally planned, I'm like, okay, I could do this. But now it's like 30 days. Mm-hmm. And I just felt like, man, this is so, so difficult. And the only people who would be able to do an RFP like this are, you know, big, big companies who have done this in other states multiple times who already know how to do all of this. Yeah. And, and so that's the next thing I want to go into is... I feel like more often these days we see our government creating this sort of idyllic situation for big corporate interests. And I see it happening in the homogenous development that happens along the Wasatch Front where they build the freeway off ramp and immediately they, they solicit superstores. Oh yeah. And they're then they have work with the big developers and they want the chain stores. And I feel like a lot of this I, I, I use the term, there's the uh, military industrial complex. I believe there's a military bureaucratic industrial complex going on as well. And it's just this perfect form fitting of corporations using the laws to get the most ideal outcomes to have predictable revenue streams. And now that's happening here with the growth of the cannabis industry do you do you see that do you see it that way do you think that the, the that the government is really doing the very best in their power to see that the biggest moneyed interests get the most money out of this new industry coming to coming to Utah you know I do th- I think a lot of it is where they they it's almost looking for for money or it's you know they want it they they're they're trying to go for the highest bidder not the person who deserves it the most mm-hmm. and that's kind of what I've what I've seen. And I understand that they want to bring in, you know, why they would bring in some out of staters because they want uh, people with experience who know what they're doing. Yeah. But at the same time, I just feel like as a, as a a fifth generation farmer and a centennial farmer, uh, I was hoping that the department of agriculture would be advocating for farmers like me because, you know, these big, these big farms that are coming in, they, uh, you know, they already have millions and millions of dollars. Some of them already have, you know, 15, 20 grows all, you know, across Yeah, this is states. like their 20th RFP they've had yeah, to write, exactly. and they can already have it done pretty much. And, and it's like, do they really, you know, they are, don't they have enough already? You know, it's like, you know, share the wealth with, you know, let, let the little guys have a chance as well. And that's where, and that's kind of where I come into play. And that's, that's why I, uh, I'm applying because, you know, it's, it's, you know, for me, farming is, it's, it's a lot more than just growing things, you know, it's a lot more about money. It's about connecting with nature. It's about uh, it's about family heritage, especially for me, being a fifth generation farmer. You know, like I'm I may be walking out in my fields all by myself, but you know I feel my ancestors right here inside me when I when I'm out there. Yeah. And I'm really grateful for the sacrifice they made to come here to 
to Utah and for me to have grown up on a farm ever since I was a little kid. So, well, I, and I wonder like, um, do you, do you know of the other big names in cannabis that have, that are applying? You know, I don't know directly. However, I just, I, I've heard a lot of things from a lot of different sources and, uh, not to put words in other people's mouths, but my business partner, uh, she was, she's been, uh, very well known in, in, uh, California for being a, you know, a great grower. And she's the kind of person who cares about mother nature, cares about, you know, creating the best medicine possible, doesn't care about the money. And she had spoken, several of these large companies had reached out to her because they wanted her to be the master grower. And she could just tell that her ideals or her, what she wanted and what they wanted were for two different things. Mm-hmm. And after talking to me, you know, we were on the same page from the very beginning. Like, I want to... I'm, I want to create medicine for children with epilepsies, for people like my sister who just finished her last treatment of chemotherapy a few weeks ago. I want to help the veterans with PTSD. I want to help the elderly. I, I feel like this is an avenue where I can leverage my skills in farming and you know these generations of you know, hard work and tradition and also use my business degree and my, my business sense uh, to really take my farm to the next level and, you know, farm all day like that's like my happy place is on my farm if i could get up every day and just be on my farm and you know feed the animals and and work on the farm all day like that would that's what makes me happiest however it's just really hard to do that and make money nowadays so yeah and that's why i saw this as such a great opportunity and it and it's been quite an educational experience i think for a lot of utahns to understand the medicinal properties of cannabis because it's been I mean, even until just two years ago, Mitt Romney was coming out saying the worst thing that could happen is the widespread legalization of cannabis. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when he was running on the campaign trail, he was very anti-medical marijuana. But now he's an advocate, but he's just saying it shouldn't be in candy, it shouldn't be for for children. I mean, how do you how do you best tell somebody or educate them? about the medicinal value of it like where do you tell them to go or what do you tell how do you explain it to somebody because i've kind of struggled with that myself well that's it's kind of funny you say that because that's something i've been I, that's what i've been learning myself right now you know i don't i don't know everything about cannabis i'm i'm an alfalfa farmer mm-hmm. but all i know is whenever the more i learn about cannabis the more intrigued i am and the more i realize how much medicine how much use there is in in, in the cannabis plant and in, and in hemp in general and so uh Uh, my business partner, just listening to her talk about, uh, and her story, you know, how she got into the medical cannabis industry and how for her it is, you know, growing medicine and how she really cares about making a difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, She tells me about different types of, you know, all these different things like tinctures and all these other, all these things I don't really know about yet. It's just whatever she says, I'm always just like, yeah, let's do this, you know? And it's like, I feel like this is, uh, you know, the reason why I wanted to partner with her is because We share the same outlook on life and we have the same values and the same goals, but I also see it as a way like she's a, she's a, she already knows how to grow. She's done this before and she can teach me all these things. And this is a, I'm the kind of person I listen to audio books all the time. I listen to podcasts whenever I'm driving around, especially on my tractors, you know, sitting on a tractor so many times, you know, Oh, yeah, the podcast got to be great. Oh, yeah, I listen to a lot of, I've been mm-hmm. listening to a lot of podcasts and a lot of, a lot of audio books. And so I love learning. I'm a, I'm a voracious reader, mm-hmm. at, at least on, you know, an audio. Mm-hmm. And so listening to her, like she just, every time we, every time we talk, I learn more and more. And that's what I find exciting. And I think uh, a lot of people are unfamiliar with it. And I feel like a lot of people have demonized or they've demonized cannabis and they think there's all these you know, it's, it's bad for you, but it's a weed, it's this and that, you know, but there's so many benefits and so many medicinal benefits that it, that it has. And, you know, that's well, why people's, people's perceptions are changing now. Even my parents, like my, you know, my parents are, you know, uh, very, I'd say they're very traditional, very old school. And when I told them I wanted to grow, I told them first I wanted to grow hemp and they were just like, well, you know, we thought you were crazy when he told us about your certified alfalfa and all your compost and when you wanted to sell rabbit hay on Amazon and he proved us wrong, so you should just go for it. And <laughs> That's awesome. And then when I told him I wanted to grow cannabis, you know, I was explaining to him, like, this is, you know, I, I, I also kind of uh, brought up a, a point to that. We have these water rights that uh, that my, my great-grandfather actually, uh, 
he got for us when we when he was a kid. So a little backstory on this: my great grandfather, first generation American in the family, first born American, ten years old, he was orphaned, and having immigrant parents, uh, there was no relatives around, and so the community came together and they raised my great grandfather and his siblings. And because the community raised him, I'm able to still farm today because we were able to keep the land in the family and he was able to farm. And uh, when he was my age, he helped dig one of the first canals into the into Spanish Fork and they gave him all these water shares. Well, about 95 years later, I'm transferring those water shares into our well, which what we will be using for industrial hemp or cannabis. And so you know, I wanted to when I, when I heard about the you know, getting the cannabis license and they wanted to talk about giving back to the community, I just thought, like, this is such a perfect opportunity, you know, for, for me to pay the dues of my great-grandfather to give back to the community that raised him mm-hmm. and to invest in the youth. And so I've talked to the FFA. I've talked to uh, the police. I've talked to uh, the Boy Scouts of America. And there's a lot of things I want to do to give back to the youth and create scholarships. But... Like I said, also give back to the police, give back to the veterans. I feel like there's so many lives I can bless by getting this license. And I've already talked to the mayor about this, and he's 100% for it as well. And so, like, this isn't, I'm not applying for this. I'm applying on behalf of my great-grandfather and also the city of Salem and Spanish Fork. That's awesome. So if I understand correctly, you when you start um, producing medical marijuana, it cannot be in view from like outside of your gate, right? Yep. So you either got to put a, a giant wall around your garden or do it all indoors. Is that correct? Yep. So you plan on doing it all inside I'm of greenhouses? I'm building a wall, yeah. Or oh, you're building a wall? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess I, I call it a compound, not a wall. But yeah, yeah that's that's the plan. I'm gonna, I want to do it outdoors. I want, oh, the thing wow, is that's, like, that's awesome. Well, the thing about, so there's a, you know, indoor and outdoor growing are very different. And, you know, there's a lot of investment that goes into indoor growing, because you have to have a facility, you have, you know, a lot of these people are spending, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars a month just on their electricity bill. And yeah. my electricity bill is the sun. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I just see as as a as a farmer, it just makes so much sense. For, it just makes sense for me to grow outdoors. It makes sense for me to want to be an organic grower and and do everything out outside on the farm. Like that's that's my happy yeah. place, you know. And so that's that's why I want to do it. And it's also it's a there's a lot less upfront cost for it. Mm-hmm. So do you do you won't do any indoor growing? Uh, you, well, you know, we're mandated to grow, uh, have product ready by February first or no March first. Sorry. So I mean, you can't really be you can't be planting anything, you know, in in, in October, November, and expecting something to grow. Mm-hmm. So uh, what we're planning on doing is is starting in greenhouses, and mm-hmm. so we'll have. The greenhouses, those will be heated, and they'll—I mean, the, it's considered a greenhouse considered outdoor, but we'll be able to grow, and we'll have lights and stuff in there. And so we'll do a, probably a grow or two by March. But you know, our main our main goal is to grow outdoors. That's cool. And I think over time we'll probably we'll probably have more green. We'll have we'll we'll add on greenhouses, and I think we'll have we'll do several types of grows where we do you know several in you know, several greenhouse grows but we still have our main outdoor grow every year like get them started in greenhouses yeah exactly and we'll, get them started yeah. or just have you know some plants to you know we want to do several harvests in the greenhouse and we might as if they're there you might as well use them so yeah that's uh, well that's i mean that's the biggest hurdle i think and the biggest problem with medical cannabis is that the way most states mandate the laws that rather than just maximize the acreage we do medical cannabis on, they, they're they limiting the acreage, so you have to do it so intensively, and then they're checking to see if you can meet the demand that's out there, that they're almost mandating you have to go indoors and use electricity, which is, you know, another scarce resource. It just seems just asinine that they don't allow more farmers do it on more to do it on more land, and 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 that they're treating it like oh we can't let kids see that marijuana is growing in a field that would be terrible, and that do, do you do you think that a lot of these laws are just completely crazy? Uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing I would say. Well, yes and no. So yes, I do think these laws are kind of crazy, but at the same time, a lot of the very best, uh, the very best cannabis you're going to get is going to be grown indoors because you're playing mother nature. You can get, you know, very potent, you know, a very high THC or very high CBD product. However, there's still a lot to be said about sun grown and organically grown and, you know, having, you know, doing it nature's way, which I think is the best way. 
Mm-hmm. And I feel like uh, for me, just as a farmer, it makes so much more sense to, you know, to, to, to grow outdoors. And the thing is you have to realize is that the people who are doing indoor grows and have the very, you know, the top shelf, the very best cannabis. They also dep- demand the hi- highest prices. And, you know, I want to create medicine for the people of Utah, but I also want to create affordable medicine for the people of Utah. And you're not going to get that with indoor grows. You're going to get that with outdoor grows. And that's so that's, point. and I, I, I think what's going to happen is that, you know, out of these 10 licenses, probably seven or so are going to go to uh, indoor growers or you know, big out of state farms. And I think they're, they're, they're going to have several outdoor growers such as myself. And hopefully I'll be selected as, as one of those. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about the price point, um, something I've seen very prohibitive in terms of making the price be manageable for patients. I mean, they say that the the number one priority is patient access and affordability, but this concept of the central fill, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's this no. idea that they want to treat cannabis exactly the same way that they treat um, liquor. And they want to have one centralized distribution center, a huge warehouse where all the cannabis comes in that's going to be distributed out. And then they want to put the state stamp of approval on everything. And um, that, to me, is going to add on a a layer of pricing that no other state in the country has because nobody else has decided they want to have a central fill. And I talked to, um, I believe his name is Drew Rigby. Drew. Yeah, about how are you going to make the price of the cannabis coming in cheap enough so that people are going to both a choose to stop buying from the black market and go legal or and or b not just go to uh mesquite or wendover and buy their cannabis to the, from those markets where it's it's going to be cheaper is that is that price point um a concern of yours or do you just kind of have to leave it up to the state for all that uh for something like that i just i figured the cheapest is going to be the sun-grown stuff, and if everybody's doing indoors, they're going to have so many costs, uh, so many upfront costs. Granted, they have millions of dollars. You know, a lot of these these indoor growers, they're going to have to have a lot more investment than I will. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just feel that doing an outdoor grow is going to bring the price, is going to make affordable products for the people of Utah, and I just don't see how doing everything indoors is going to is going to be like that. And I think people want their people want variety. I think people are going to want, you know, like as, as, as great as top shelf is, people want naturally, you know, naturally sun-grown cannabis. Is there some, is there quite a bit of that in California and other states that are growing outdoors? Do you, do you know? Uh, I, there's, there's got to be a bunch of them. I'm partnered with one of them, so. Oh, she grows outdoors? Well, she, she mm-hmm. did grow outdoors, so she, uh, yeah, when she had her, uh, her, can, her medical cannabis license in California, she was an outdoor grower, an outdoor organic uh, cannabis farmer. Okay, And cool. so she would, I, I wanted her to come today. But she had work and other things she uh, the, she couldn't uh, get out of today. So yeah, I'll have to see if she can come on. Yeah, we'll have to have her come on because she's yeah. she's the one that knows. Because I knows feel like everything. this will be an ongoing discussion. Because Drew, when I posed that question to him, I could tell that was a major concern. And what they added to the law was that the price of medical cannabis once they start selling it, it cannot be more than 10% of the existing market price. And I would assume he, by existing market, he means the black market. Yeah. Um, because having that restriction on there, it, hopefully they would use that to know that that central fill idea is just does not make any sense at all. And yeah. Well, I don't know anything about the, the black market prices or anything here. So that's something that's unfamiliar to me. But I just know if you want, if you want the most affordable medicine the most affordable cannabis it's going to have to be an outdoor grow and that's where that's where i already have the land i already have the water i already have the compost i already have somebody who who knows how to go outdoors and so uh not only is it not only do i have you know i have most of the the ingredients i have most of everything all ready to go yeah and so for me that my initial outlay is going to be much less and also when you grow outdoors you also get a lot more you get a lot more uh flour and you get a lot more of your product out there so the you know, indoor indoor plants are going to be smaller and more concentrated mm-hmm. but the outdoors it's going to be 
they're going to be much larger plants. And so that's why you get, even though you get one, let's say if you're just doing an outdoor grow, you get one big, you get one harvest, but it's a big harvest. Yeah. And that's where I feel like it's going to be, uh, what I, what I pr- am proposing to do is, you know, I still have a bunch of outdoor, but I'm going to build some more greenhouses so I can do several grows th- uh, throughout the year and they'll still be, they'll still get very large. And so that's, do you know what you can get per acre? Like how much flour you're able to, uh, harvest per acre when you're doing outdoors with, well, that can depend on how you're spacing your plants. That can depend on, uh, also if they're going to be in raised beds, or if you're going to windrow them, there's, you know, those are, those are kind of questions. There's, that's not the easiest answer. And some people are, you know, I know some people are going to grow, you know, a thousand plants per acre. Some could grow 1500. Oh, if they're growing, depending what type of plant it is, if it's an indica, it's going to be a lot smaller plant. If it's a sativa, it's going to be as big as a tree. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, for those different things, you have to space accordingly. And that's where, uh, my business partner, Ashley, she, she knows all that kind of stuff, and she I've I've know. talked to her about that, and so we are definitely going to uh, maximize, and we're going to make sure that we can produce as much as we can for the people of Utah, because you know per unit, you know if we're growing, let's say we're just growing a, a thousand per acre, if we're if we grow fourteen, fifteen hundred, it's going to be it's going to be more work, but I feel like it it's going to be. Uh, you know, there's going to be economies of scale. There's going to be efficiencies. And you'll be using tractors to plant and oh, harvest. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, We've nice. got all sorts of tractors. And so uh, there's going to be more things we'll need to invest in on the farm. But like I said, we have most everything. We got the tractors. We got the land. We got the water. You know, we've got cool. we got the pioneer spirit behind us. I mean, what more what more do we need? Yeah. The I license. Mean, yeah, that's right. Um, and talking about the pioneer spirit, I, I really liked what you had to say at that meeting, that the original vision of the Mormon pioneers who, who came out here was self-sufficiency. Yeah. And it was to, I mean, Brigham Young's vision was, let's create little self-sufficient communities, almost completely self-sufficient, so that we they weren't reliant on, um, first of all, like, importing so many products that they needed just to survive. And second of all, let's try to understand that if we're spending so much money on exports, then we're ultimately hurting our economy because there goes our currency. I mean, he physically would have to deal with that because they had such a limited supply of gold in the valley originally that they'd watch the the gold just like be spent on tobacco, coffee, and these other things. Do you think like our state legislature and a lot of leaders have lost, completely forgotten that that, that's the vision that Brigham Young had? And you know, that's that's kind of how I felt uh, when I read the RFP for the first time when they were when they were letting out of state people apply and. And all these other things, I just felt like the you know the the state of Utah was turning the backs on their own people, people with pioneer heritage, like me. I'm a centennial farmer, yeah. And you know, yeah. I, I my I, ancestors were pioneers too. Yeah, exactly. So. The thing is, most of the people here in Utah, you know, they they do have a pioneer heritage, and some you know some don't. But there's a lot of people like me. You know, my family is my family immigrated here from Iceland and Denmark, and that's the thing is Brigham Young sent all the Scandinavians down towards Spanish Fork. That's why. I, if you're for, if you're you know the Icelanders, all of them all of them settled in Spanish Fork. They didn't go to any other cities. That's where Brigham Young sent them. He was like, "This is the place for the Icelanders." Spanish Fork, Utah. <laughs> Do you know why that was? I'm not exactly sure why, huh. but that's where they all went, and they didn't go other places. I mean, at least within Utah. Yeah, I know there's you know Gimli, Manitoba is a big place for a lot of uh, Icelandic immigrants, and there's a few other places within North America. But Spanish Fork is, they were the first ones on the map. Well, what I think is so super cool about Brigham Young and what he did is he wouldn't just go to Iceland and get converts. He'd say, I need a shoemaker. I need a bread maker. I need somebody who can make, you know, mills, water mills. And he knew those essential skills that the community had to have to be Mm self-reliant. And so he'd say, okay, you know how to farm. You know how to make bread. And you know how to mill. I need you guys to come to this community because that's exactly what you're going to do. And yeah, exactly. He's made you know micro economies all over the place in Utah, and that's why Utah is the beehive state. You know, bees. Uh, the beehive represents industry and hard work. That you know everybody is a, is a uh, as a is a worker working from you know sun up to sundown. 
and not being as the drones that don't do anything at all. You know, they're just there to propagate and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is, you know, the bees have so many, uh, they have so many things that they do. So they, you know, they, they're getting food day and night. Uh, they're also protecting the hive as well. And that's one thing I, 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 I had mentioned, you know, like I want to protect my hive. This is my state, you know, like my family immigrated here because they had, they had a dream and they had faith in a new promised land. And they were, they were those pioneers who believed in Zion. And to me, the, the beehive isn't just about industry. It's about creating a Zion, creating mm -hmm. self-sufficiency, working in harmony with each other, just as the bees do. And so, you know, as, as one of these bees and a fifth generation farmer, you know, I need to, I want to protect the hive. I want to protect Zion. Yeah. And that's where I worry about these large companies coming in that don't share the same values, that don't care about the state of Utah, that just care about money and figures. They don't care about creating medicine for other people and about changing lives and giving back to the community. And that's, you know, that's where I keep going back to thinking of my great grandfather and how indebted I am to not only to him, but to my community. And that's why I want to give back. And my family's been giving back for years. I mean, my mom was the president of the American Legion Auxiliary for several years. Every year we give gift baskets to the veterans and all the rest homes in the area. Um, I also, I uh, gave school supplies and medical equipment to a school in Juarez, Mexico for my Eagle Scout project. Nice. Um, and so we, I, my family has been very uh, involved in philanthropy and giving back to the community. And so that's where, when, when I'd heard about everything, I was just like, this is, there's so many lives I can bless, so many people I can help. And also just developing the youth in our country. You know, a lot of people complain about millennials or, or kids nowadays, uh, but I feel like they're they're also very smart. And I feel like every older generation is always going to say the younger generation has it easier, this or that. Mm -hmm. But you know that we still need to invest in our future, and that's you know that's FFA, Boy Scouts, 4-H scholarships to the kids uh, in the high schools, and so though those are things I want to do is give back and raise the community that raised my great great grandfather. That's great. Cool. Well, we'll take a little break, and when we get back, we'll talk about. Uh, the, the, the greater concept of local self-reliance, and I also want to get into a little bit more about um, dispelling myths about cannabis, about marijuana, and the propaganda campaign that went on before that basically Ill made prohibition the standard and, and why that's now lifting. Yeah. So when we get back, we'll talk about that. Great. The Utah Story Show is brought to you in part by the Made in Utah Festival. Now you got to mark your calendars and check it out. August 24th and the 25th, we are having a giant, massive party in the heart of downtown Salt Lake City where 200 craft vendors will come bringing their products locally made, locally crafted to Gateway in downtown Salt Lake City where you'll be able to sample the best of craft cocktails, craft beer, all everything handmade, hand woven, handcrafted from other vendors, food vendors, as well as product vendors. Um, it's just an amazing display of all the incredible things that are made in Utah. So be sure to mark your calendars. And second of all, if you want to be both a part of the festival and a part of this program, then you should become a member of Utah Stories and Made in Utah. So what that involves is a subscription of to our service of $9.99 per month or $99 for the entire year, where we will send you a VIP ticket with a $50 value to our upcoming Made in Utah Festival, and you will be part of our member community where you get to chime in on things that we cover, comment, and help us drive the best type of coverage that we can provide to you in mainly covering the things that help shape Utah. I mean, that's what we want to cover in this program, the things that are driving and shaping Utah and actually bringing on the people who make a difference in our community. So I hope you get on uh, madeinutahfest.com to uh, reserve either your VIP ticket or go to utahstories.com to become a member of our Utah Stories Made in Utah community. Okay, we're back with Lyle Christensen, the Viking farmer, and 
Um, we were talking a little bit off air about modern industrial wheat and GMO. Is that something that you think is a problem in the United States, or where do you, how do you land on that? Uh, with GMO, the problem is there's not as I, I don't feel like there's as many studies about this. You know, if, if people eat GMO for years and years, like what is that? You know, we don't have you know long term studies on this. But what I what I have heard is you know giving you know, GMO alfalfa to, you know for example to horses it, it can affect their fertility, and you know it looks fine it, it seems fine and everything but you know I I don't think throwing chemicals and everything is is should should be the answer and so I think some people instead of turning to Mother Nature they just turn to chemicals or you know some other synthetic man made uh, idea to uh, to fix a, to solve a problem. Yeah, I I've been a, a backyard gardener for like 25 years. I've been way into gardening and I loved fertilizer and I was a fertilizer proponent. I mean, I'd tell everybody if you want if you want to get the best yields out of your space, use fertilizer and use it properly. And but what I came to realize is that the biological processes that happen in the soil for every bit of fertilizer you use, you're killing off the natural biological processes and you're, you're killing off the, the natural bacteria and fungi that actually feeds the plant roots. D- is that something you, you also agree with? I mean, I, I, I know there's... Using chemicals? Yeah, it oh, yeah, degrades the soil. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, that's, and, that's, yeah, that's very well documented. You know, I... I, I I haven't tested myself. It's like, okay, well, I, I, so for example, I have worms, so I have vermicompost. Like, I'm not spraying Roundup on the top of it just to see if they die or not. You know, I'd, I just, I just think the natural solution is always is is the best solution. And I remember uh, when I first moved back to Utah. Uh, so for it, one thing to know about farmers is if you want to spray weevil or insecticides, you have to have a pesticide license. And my dad had weevil in one of his fields. And he had he doesn't have a license for for that, and so he wanted IFA to come over, and they took like two weeks to come over. By then, he my dad had lost the crop completely to weevil, Jeez. and I just remember seeing that, and it, it didn't it, those weren't my fields; they were his. And I'm like, I'm never going to let that happen to me. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, so how do I learn about how do I get one of these pesticide licenses? And I'm like, oh, well, you have to read a book and you know take a test. It's actually not too difficult, but the thing I I uh, I, uh, I thought was funny about the about the book is the first chapter. It's like don't just throw chemicals at everything. There's all these other things you should do before you try to do something like that. And that's where I say, like, I'm not an organic farmer, but I'm an organic-ish farmer or want to be an organic farmer. Because, you know, in the past, you know, I've had to, I've had to use chemicals before to get rid of weevil or, or whatnot or get re- remove a pest. Yeah. But there's so many other precautions, other things you can do to prevent uh, – to prevent infiltra- infiltration of pests onto mm-hmm. your fields and onto your farm. And so that's what the thing when I when I take in this test, like they were talking about all these other things you can do before you start throwing chemicals on things. It should be like the last resort. And if you do use it, you should be writing stuff down. You should be it should be very well documented and you you know, use it sparingly, so to speak. Yeah. And and I think that what a lot of consumers don't quite understand is like there's a huge difference between like hardcore pesticides, which have been mostly banned in the United States. They haven't totally been banned in Mexico. And a pesticide that does minimal damage to your your the biology and your soil and mm-hmm. the biology and the other plant life, but just target one species. Yeah. And so, and I don't know how you can actually farm on a really large scale completely organically when you're doing you know, fruits for one thing. And then, um, alfalfa, I don't, I can't, I can't say I know a whole lot about alfalfa. Well, that's, that's the thing is, uh, you know, if we all switched organic farming tomorrow, we'd starve. Yeah. And that's the thing is, you know, large scale farming or large scale organic farming is much more difficult to do. Uh, Mm. I don't think it's impossible, but I just feel the way, the way things work in the world right now, we can't just all switch to organic farming. And I think that's something where, uh, I, uh, I think there's several things that need to change. Um, one is uh, obviously try to be more organic farming, try to support your local farmers. But I think another thing is like what you were, what you were talking about is uh, you have your own garden. You know, I think uh, I think everybody should learn how to farm and have a green thumb themselves, uh, whether that be growing vegetables or having a beehive or mm-hmm. knowing how to can your own food, being self-sufficient in that way. 
And that's one thing for me is I've noticed, uh, you know, when I go to these these uh, farm sales or when I go to these these conferences, you know, I'm I'm definitely the, the on the younger side of the demographic. There are very few people who are younger like me in these things, and a lot of it is just older men. Uh, and uh, I just feel that it's an opportunity for you know somebody young like me to to kind of go in and change things and and uh, change the game, so to speak. Yeah, and is are most of the people you're in act, interacting with are they totally not or into the organic movement? And beca- because they're older, they've been doing it the tried and true way with fertilizer, pesticide, and all that. Yeah, well, I think uh, I think when people have been doing something the same way for so long, it's hard for them to think outside of of whatever that reality is. So for my dad, he. Uh, when I told him I wanted to start making compost, he's like, well, we spread manure out in the fields and it just grows a bunch of weeds. And that's true because if you just get, if you're feeding, you know, uh, hay to cattle that has weeds in it, all they're going to do is like the weeds are going to stay into, into the, the manure and it's just going to, and it's just going to grow. You're going to spread it. What, what you have to do is compost it correctly. So you have to add in the carbon source, like some straw, and you also have to water it to heat it up. And then you know, I use compost thermometers where it gets up to you know, 130, 150 degrees. That cooks all the weed seeds out there, gets all those microbes going, and then you aerate it, you turn it a bunch, and put more water, and just keep going. And, and then you, like, you know, you get this big pile of smelly manure, and you within a month or so, it's just like a dark looking, uh, you know, fluffy dirt, and it's an amazing it's, yeah, thing. And I remember, is. I so like my dad, I I had been making this compost, and my dad was just he was still skeptical about you're just gonna grow a bunch of weeds or whatever and i was like how about i just put on one half this barley field and we'll see what difference it makes Mm -hmm. well that fall i put barley out on one half the field we you know tilled it up a little bit and we planted barley and uh the barley on the side where i put my compost in it was about six inches taller it was a deeper green uh much bigger heads a lot more grain out of it and even after it got uh when the combine came through, we had almost twice as much fiber, almost twice as many, you know, straw bales on one side as opposed to the other. And, wow. you know, the neighbors were asking about it. Other farmers were asking about That's it. Awesome. And my dad's like, okay, well, maybe you have a point. <laughs> so are you going to put on the other side now? And I was like, of course, you know. And so That's a great I think story. once they see, uh, you know, there's, I think a lot of people in general, older, the older generation, they're, you're, they're used to seeing things in one way. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, once they see things another way or they open their mind a little bit, then they say, okay, yeah, okay, this, this makes sense. And I think that's kind of how my, you know, my dad was with farming when I talked to him all the new things I wanted to do. And, uh, and I also think just with cannabis in general, you know, like my parents probably were not very uh, supportive of medical cannabis, you know, years ago. But now they, you know, they're just, they're just like, well, you can't refute the evidence, you know, it's, 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 it helps a lot of people. And that's when you, you see children who have, you know, you know, getting seizures every day. And that's uh, a bunch of, you know, seizures over and over Mm -hmm. again, they try all these medicines and all these chemicals, you know, the the medicine, all it is, is just chemicals as well. That's the Mm -hmm. thing is like, you know, we talk about GMO and all this stuff. Well, medicine they're taking is all, it's just chemicals. It's just all these chemical compounds that give them all these weird side effects, you know, and all these other issues. And then they try something naturally that, you know, that comes from a plant and, you know, their, uh, their seizures go away. That's why there's a, there's a strand called Charlotte's Web. Mm-hmm. And that was a little girl who had uncontrollable seizures all the time. Parents finally were just to their wits end and, and somebody had mentioned, you know, medical cannabis. And they did that and their, her, you know, her, her seizures went away completely. Yeah. And so. That's... And, and that, that compelling story, I think, is what blaze the trail for not just in Utah for CBD to become legal a, few, a couple yeah. of years ago, but all over the country. And, um, and I think it's, it's just irrefutable. Yeah. It's just no question about it. There's nothing more effective for epilepsy, especially in children than high CBD, low THC, yeah. you know, product. And, and I feel cannabis. like that's, you could, you could say the same thing about organic farming or gardening in your own home. You know, what the, the, if you're, if you're composting and if you're making a garden, growing it as organically as possible at home, you know, you can small, like organic farming is a much easier small scale. Yeah, And that's yeah. where if everybody can learn to be, everybody can learn to do a few things like that, you know, and then we can create a generation where everyone can be farmers. And that's my dream. You know, I, I sit down at, at these meetings with the water master and I'm only guy under 60. And, you know, I'm like, I am part of a dying breed, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, but then I kind of, I, instead of thinking that I'm a dying breed, it's more, I need to educate everybody. 
And I need to show everyone there's a farm in all of us, whether that be learning how to garden, whether that, whether that be, uh, you know, making your own compost or, uh, you know, being a beekeeper or, you know, learning how to can your own foods or mm-hmm. supporting the, you know, the local farmers. There are so many things that, that people uh, can do to be farmers in their own way. And that's what I'd like to do in the future. Amen. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. I, Because uh, I tried organic gardening um, using supplements in my soil first. But my soil I'd, I'd used for 10 years with fertilizer, it was inert. It had, had no biological activity. To rebuild that yeah. biology, you have to compost. Oh, yeah. You have to. I mean, you can bring in a ton of compost, you know, literally like a thousand pounds for a small garden in your backyard, or you can learn to compost your leaves and your grass clippings and and all that. And you can see how much additional work goes into it. But then once you finally get that result from composting, it's just like, for me, it's so satisfying Oh, totally. because you're not buying this bag of fertilizer. I, I got some chickens and the chickens were providing the nitrogen, and then my straw was providing the carbon. And then, like you said, you water it, you, you let it heat up, and then it just turns into this amazingly dark, beautiful product. And then you watch your your vegetables just flourish, and it's so incredibly satisfying. I just yeah, I love I, it. I totally agree about. I, I totally agree with you on that one. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is people don't realize how easy it can be. And another thing like you're saying is you know making your own compost. You know exactly where it came from. You go to Home Depot or you go somewhere else. You don't know where it's come from. And that's the thing is I have a lot of gardeners who come back to me every year because they say you know because uh, they say you know whenever I put your compost out on my gardens I have the best yields. And so I've had people coming back every year for the past three years since I started doing making my own compost. And that's the thing is like, well, what is this? I'm like, well, I'll tell you, it's manure from that corral over there and some old straw and it's mixed up. Here's some water and like show my thermometers and open up my Google doc to show them like, okay, this see, I turned it on these su- such and such dates. And the, these were the temperature readings that I was getting for each of them. And, you know, I have these, you know, I have several windrows, you know, I have, so I have, I start with the first windrow and that's smelly manure or whatever. And as I turn it and it goes down, it goes down the line, I start a new windrow of compost. And so I have several going at the same time. And mm-hmm. you can see that you can see the progression where it's like, you know, smelly manure and some straw down to the very end where it's just fluffy dirt. And there's, oh, you know, man. it doesn't even, people just think, what are you, where are you getting all this dirt from? I'm like, that's actually all manure. Wow. And so we got to come see that. True. Oh yeah, totally. Out. And so that's, that's yeah. the thing. That's what excites me is, uh, you know, there are other types of, uh, of composting I'm getting into now. So I, like I said earlier, uh, I started vermicomposting. So I have worms and, uh, I've been, fe- I, I can, I feed them manure. I also feed them, uh, food scraps for my work. So my, my work gives us uh, lunch every day. And so sometimes there's extra salad that people don't want. And I just take the whole thing and feed that to my worms. But there are other things I've been I've been dabbling into. For example, biochar. Oh, uh, yeah. I started doing that. Uh, yeah. I started making That's that myself. Amazing. We had a tree that died on the farm, and so I started making biochar from that. Uh, but I said early with bokashi. So bokashi is a gem, it's a Japanese form of composting where they uh, ferment it, hmm. and anyways, it, it becomes probiotic. And so you you mix your bokashi into into uh, you know you know you you. You, you create your almost your different arsenal of different types of you know vermicompost and and, and 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 composted manure and biochar and then you also have something like bokashi where it's also probiotic and you hmm. you kind of mix these things and you're 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 opening up a spec you know very wide spectrum of bacteria mm-hmm. and so by by going into different avenues of composting you can get a much uh, more diverse uh, diverse set of microbes and, and, and having living soil. Say that word again. I've never heard of that. Bokashi. Bokashi. B-O-K. Huh. It's fermented A-S-H-I. compost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, you have some. We've this, never written about that. Yeah, and it's never EM1 seen that. is what you buy. So it's like this microbe. And you mix that in with uh, like a alpha, not alfalfa meal, but with uh, you can mix that in with uh, like uh, cracked wheat or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, wheat bran. And then you put and you put some molasses in there and some and you get it wet and what happens is those the, the microbes they kind of they start growing and they attach to the, to the, the wheat bran or whatever, and then you dry it out after a few weeks but it has all that bacteria that's just been growing Does in there. It start and out then, as like a beer. Yeah, just about <laughs> it's like almost. A it's like wort? almost like malting your own you know malting your own barley, mm-hmm. and then what you can do is uh, you 
you you pack down your your you know your food waste and you kind of sprinkle it and you layer you layer it but you're doing anaerobic composting which oh. doesn't take air yeah and what it does is it pretty much it, it ferments it but it creates you know these these probiotic uh, bacteria strands and so you feed bokashi to your plants and that helps them be it almost is like uh, it gives them a it almost makes it, it makes them probiotic essentially it makes them have much stronger uh, defenses against illnesses and sicknesses and, mm-hmm. and and you know pests and other things like that it makes them much stronger yeah. and that's why you know that's there's a there's a saying or something i read that farmers have three times the immunity of a normal person because they have so much exposure to bacteria and that's that's how it is with me. Like all my friends and everybody, they always comment because I I le- eat literally anything and I never get sick. I have an iron gut, really? and part of that's because I, I I drink you know I drink kefir. I've made my own kombucha. I try to eat very healthy, and so I I have a probiotic lifestyle in that sense. But I'm also you know I'm I'm playing around in manure piles yeah. and and playing in the dirt all the time on the farm. And so like you know like my hands are kind of clean right now. But when I got into work, they were you know I I was working till. 6 30 in the morning raking all my hay all night about 50 acres of what i did and i slept in my truck for you know two and a half hours i'm like okay well it's time to go to my day job and jeez and so there's wow. you know, my summer there's in the summers for me there are times where i have to irrigate all night or i have to cut or bale hay or rake or do something and i have to pull all nighters and just kind of make ends meet jeez but Such you stay, but you farm. stay healthy. I yeah, guess exactly. I guess you build up your microbiome. I I've heard. Yeah. So we did a story about forest. Uh, a, a woman who takes people on on forest tours where it's designed to help get you both in a meditative state, but help build your microbiome because mm-hmm. of all of the fungi and bacteria oh, yeah. in the forest. And and we can actually actively do that by spending more time in wild places and in nature. Oh yeah. You know, build up our immunity and microbiome, and and I'm sure you, as long, if you're yeah. doing organic to that extent, you're getting that beneficial bacteria. Yeah, and it's funny, funny you say that because uh, so my business partner Ashley, so she talks about she's talked to me about uh, there's a type of uh, um, farming in Korea. It's called natural. What is it? Natural farming or or whatever. Anyways. Uh, she talked about how other ways you can get other types of bacteria or microbes into your into your your compost or whatever is you know the, the this type of I think it's called microbacilia and it's like these types of this type of mold that can grow on trees and what you do is you have like a wicker box you know, have a, this little wicker box with some with some rice in it or whatever and the, and anyways you kind of bury it next to those areas where those where that uh, that bacteria or that mold is and it, it goes on to that and then what you can do is you can replicate that bacteria or that mold and then you can put that on a compost tease and you're you're adding another level you know another spectrum of bacteria and, and microorganisms into your composting yeah. and it's like she talks about these things I'm like man that's something I haven't even thought of I'm like that's amazing that's like I'm I'm like I was looking at uh, what was I was looking at walmart.com or whatever to see where I can get some wicker wicker baskets and I'll just you know boil a bunch of rice and I want to try that and we actually had this tree that died on our farm we had this huge huge tree and I played on when I was a little kid and anyways it, it finally died and it's kind of broken up into pieces and anyways we were breaking up part of the bark because she's saying oh you have to go out in the forest to find this bacteria or whatever find this this find this mold and it's typically on old logs and trees and stuff and anyways we started breaking open the tree and I'm like look it's right wow, here and she's like yeah cool. that's it and so we're going to start doing that but we're also going to go out into the forest we're going to get some of the microbes out there as well and you just use so, cooked rice in a wicker basket yeah yeah wow. and, and what happens that's it awesome. kind of transfers one to the other you have to make sure there's shade and other things so there's a few other there's a few other ways to few more requirements and things to do, make it work properly. But then, we, she, you know, she and I were, you know, I get excited. And she can see how excited yeah, I am. She's teaching me something new like this. That's and really then cool. that's where, you know, I'm, just, I'm probably butchering all the stuff we're talking about. But, you know, that's, she's Well, I've just expert. heard about leaf mold and, oh, yeah, and leaf how mold that's just an amazing. Or... Well, I guess you, you add a bacteria. I, I don't know enough about it to really speak about it, but I guess you add a bacteria to your pile of leaves. Mm-hmm. And it's a mold, and it just it creates this really nice, rich compost. If you're if you're dealing mostly with leaves, yeah. and you're just trying to get see that's see that's something molded. else I'm going to look up. I get leaves on the farm as well, so yeah, so yeah, I love it. I just think composting is the most yeah. under talked about, most exciting thing you can possibly do in your backyard and your home, and and actually get a sense of like getting that connection with your food because yeah. you're literally growing the biology that produces the nutrients that feeds the roots of your of your crops of, of everything yeah. you're growing 
Yeah, and see, that's what that's what excites me. All these types of composting and other ways to introduce these these uh, you know bacteria into your into your fields or into your crops, and you're know, using you're doing it in the natural way. So it's you know I'm a, I may be a data scientist by day, but you know I'm a I'm a natural I'm nature scientist for life, and that's that's what I do. That's what I love about farming so much. It's that's experimenting with all these new things, you know. And growing up as a conventional farmer, I always like, oh, you just throw chemicals on things, and that's that's just what you do. This is the American way, you know. It's mm. like what my dad's taught me, and you know, not like saying that that's that's a terrible thing. Like you know, it's th- just a different like, paradigm. I, I, yeah, exactly. It's not it's, it's not totally ter- it's paradigm. not terrible. It's a way of growing crops and exactly. doing it very cheaply. But it's a completely different paradigm. Yeah, it's... exactly. And so that's where, for me, I be I, I gravitate towards that a lot more. And like I said, like I'm not an organic farmer, but I'm org- I, I'm organic as I want to do as many organic things as possible. And that's where you know, like in that pesticide license, they're just like you know, you should just be throwing chemicals on things. That's not the way you should be. You know, that's not way you should be doing everything. And so yeah, that's where I wanted to. You know, I've I've found enjoyment in in trying new things and. And that's what I love about farming. It's just experimenting all the time. And yeah, that's awesome. It's like every every day going to the farm. It's just I'm 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 experimenting with something new. I'm just you know a, a nature scientist, and so that's that's so rewarding for me as well. And also seeing doing something organically and seeing how you're doing an even better job than you were conventionally. And so mm-hmm. like that that for me is so so rewarding. Yeah. So you, you know, like I like I've always said is uh, Mother Nature is my sac- is my secret weapon. Nice. Yeah, and and so um, how do people buy your compost? Do you just sell it by the yeah, side I was, of the road? Yeah, I typically just put it on KSL. Like I have professional really? photos. So if you, what is it, Salt Magazine? Amazon on, and KSL. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't sell it. I only sell my alfalfa on Amazon. But just you know, my yeah. compost on KSL. That's that's what bought that's what bought some of my farm equipment. I needed a new hay rake, and so selling that compost, and that's what I that's what I've done. This the, you know this summer I haven't put up any ads yet, just because I've been focused on getting this this. Uh, this grower's license Mm -hmm. and so like this rfp even though i have you know my business partner who's done this the past she's like there's still things on here that we that were they did not ask for in california and there's still a lot of things we got to do and so you know i have to manage that i have to manage my amazon business i i shipped off a couple hundred units out to fulfillment centers so i'm like okay like i got a couple weeks now you know but you know next week i've got to i got to get a few more i got you sell by the bale of hay or how do you sell it so actually what i do is i sell in small increments so a bale of hay is about 70 pounds Mm -hmm. and what i do is i sell alfalfa in five ten and 25 pound increments and so i have these as little as five pounds yeah so Mm -hmm. my my target market is not horses anymore it's rab people with rabbits chinchillas guinea pigs even tortoises, somebody somebody put like a five star review down and say, "Oh man, my tortoise loves this alfalfa," and and all these other things. I'm like, tortoises eat alfalfa, and I was like googling and reading. It. I'm like, huh? And I'm like, then I look up. I'm like, wait, people can eat alfalfa too? You know, there's like alfalfa meal where people will mix in with their green smoothies and stuff, and it's like a another superfood. I'm like, shoot, I, I I make green smoothies a lot, you know, with kale and all the other stuff. I'm like, I should just cut off some of my alfalfa, put that in there. I mean, Jeez. I practically, I practically inhale alfalfa if I, if I bale hay in an open cab tractor. So, wow. you know, I already know what the taste is. So there, so you're, you're fulfilling your orders to mostly people's pets. Yeah. yeah it's for pet owners. And that's so, awesome, man. And so that's I would the have thing never, is ever imagined my, that. my competitors are big corporate farms, mm-hmm. you know, with thousands of acres and their hay is good. Um, they're probably focusing on yield and not quality. And that's the thing is I, I can show you pictures of my hay next to theirs. So mine is greenest. It is the freshest. That's the, like, if you read my, my, my reviews, like people are saying, you know, I open up this box and I feel like I just walked into a field and people are posting pictures of like their rabbit or their, or their, or their chinchilla. Like somebody put up a, a video of like a week or two ago of their chinchilla eating my alfalfa. And they talk about how their, their pets go crazy whenever they see it. And I think like, the reason why is because you know these big farms, my competitors, you know they're that that alfalfa passes through many hands. They're you know they have some guy who irrigates, some people putting some fertilizers on there. You know some guy cuts it, another guy bales it, takes it over to warehouse, they chop it up into pieces, or whatever, and, and sell that. Mm-hmm. But you know I I've done everything start to finish. You know soup to nuts. Like I I plowed the fields myself. I put in my own compost. I seeded it. I irrigated it. I fertilized it again. I do multiple fertilizer applications. I get it certified weed free. I lab test it. I test my soil. Jeez. I do all these. Like that's the thing is, it's like I never done any of this stuff a few years ago. I mean, mm-hmm. I've been like my. I started working on a tractor when I was eight years old. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was uh, 
eight, my, my dad needed another tractor because uh, we just bought 60 more acres of land. And so he bought this Massey Ferguson 265, just an open cab tractor. But I was there when he got it. And I remember eight years old, I sat on my dad's lap and we would disc a field together, harrow, you know, and he would, I would pretend like I was steering it, but, you know, if I was doing something off, he'd always, you know, put his hand over, but he, I, I learned how to drive a tractor to eight years old, steering on my dad, you know, on my cool. dad's lap. And then by the time I was nine years old, he just let me out on the, he's like, okay, here's a field, you know, you know what to do, just go in these circles. And, do, <laughs> and like, I look back at it That's now awesome. and I, like my sister has, you know, I have a sister in Payson with three kids and her. Uh, one of them is nine years old, and I'm like, I could not imagine like just letting him on a tractor and saying, "Okay, knock yourself Do you, out." Could just you reach the pedals? Okay. I mean, it, when I was a little kid, you know, I had, I had to st- I had to stand up and then really push down on the clutch in order to change it. But the thing is, you know, I would always just always was in low third gear or something like that, which isn't very fast. Mm-hmm. But I'd have to stand up, push it down, and wow. kind of shift it in the neutral. I'd I'd do it. All I would do is I would shift it in the third, or I'd shift it in the neutral and stop. And that was. Man, didn't do anything awesome. else and it was just a you know a, a, a flat field or whatever but you know the lawn when I was like 10. yeah <laughs> yeah my dad let me take over the lawnmower yeah. when i was like 12. <laughs> you know when i was a little kid i made a couple mistakes here and there as i got older you know and then i started you know at 12 years old i started bailing hay you know uh then i was about 13 14 i started cutting hay and then about 15 16 then i was plowing and i started you know by the time i was 16 i could do just about anything on the farm and so my dad it's funny, my parents had sold some land and they got money and they bought me a brand new truck in high school. And I thought it was, it was just like a plain F-150. It was nothing mm-hmm. fancy. It was the, the, the lower end of it, but it was a new truck. And I was like, oh man, this is so crazy. But I was pretty much an indentured servant from then on. And so, you know, I would, my dad was a meat inspector. He worked over at Circle V and out in Spanish Fork or a few other places in the area. And a lot of times I would, you know, I would have to, uh, I'd have to feed my dad's cattle for him or I, you know, at the time I was, you know, 16, I was doing three quarters of the, uh, the work in the fields for him. Wow. And so, you know, I, you don't, you don't, you don't have any brothers or sisters or, you... uh, actually I'm the youngest of five children, but you know, none of my oh. siblings, uh, never, they didn't take the farming like I did. You know, it's, it's funny because I have a, my brother was the president of FFA. My sister was the president of FFA and I never did FFA at all. I did Boy Scouts instead. And hmm. yet I'm the one who came back and I'm the farmer. So go wow. figure. But, you know, my family, uh, you know, farming is a struggle in a lot of ways. You know, it's uh, my family. We didn't have very much growing up, but we had everything we needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we got older, my parents started selling selling land. And then we got a new truck and then we got some new tractors, better equipment. And that that made things a lot more enjoyable, having a having a tract, a cab tractor with, you know, a radio and it had a beverage cooler inside it and all those other oh, yeah. things. When I was a kid, I'm like, wow, this is crazy. I read know? an article that the you can binge Netflix movies as a tractor oh, farmer yeah. well, because you could just put your tractor on GPS. Oh, yeah, and... the GPS. Yeah, you have to unlock that for a bunch of money. Yeah. But uh, I, we have GPS technology that's baked into two of our tractors, but you have to pay all this money in order to do that. And the thing is, if I had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres – then it would make a lot of sense to do automation on that. But for me, I only got 80 acres, and that, that, that takes all the fun out of it for me, so to speak. And so I, I like doing it freestyle anyways. Yeah. But, uh, you know, for me, when I'm on my tractors, I'm just I'm just listening to audiobooks or, you know, thinking about things I want to do next or things on the farm that I need to do. Be relaxing. Oh, yeah, it's very relaxing. It's almost like, you know, my, my brain goes on autopilot. You know, I have a, I have a rake. Uh, like, so for example, I was raking hay, uh, raking hay, and I have three levers I have to pull, and then I have another switch with three little switches on it. And so I'm using like both my hands and the wheel steering around and moving these things around these these wheel ra- these two rakes or whatever. And it's it's funny how it's become su- it's like second nature, or you know, plowing fields or working on the, the tractor. Like sometimes I'm do- moving all these things around, but it's like all, it's all automated. My head's like an algorithm. You know, I, I saw. Hmm. I can solve a Rubik's cube in like around a minute or so. I learned how to do that when I was living in Iceland, and it's it, you just learn algorithms. And it's like I just look at a cube. I don't even think, and you know, I just start solving without thinking. And that's what happens with, with me and with farming on my tractors. I'm just thinking about stuff, and then I put on audiobooks, and I'm just I I, I listen to audiobooks like about business, about economics, about statistics, about you know. Uh, also, just like social behavior, I also, you know, I every once in a while I read a little bit of, you know, fiction as well. I mm-hmm. I read Harry Potter for the first time uh, mm-hmm. this last year, and actually, I I was kind of at the age when Harry Potter came out. I was a little old for it, you know. I'm like, oh, that's that's not like that's for little kids or whatever, you know. Yeah. And then it wasn't until like last year I listened to him. I'm like, man, this is like, now you're just so 
I'm like, this is like literal. This is like a literary masterpiece for like I can see why little kids and like that's what I keep hearing. So I I I have not read Harry Potter. And my little brother says that you got to read it. It's awesome. Well, and, if you and want I'm the like, audio the... books, that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah, I probably should just listen to it. So, I'm listening to podcasts all the time too. Yeah, I, I listen to podcasts great. as well. But that was you know one fantasy uh, that was that I guess that was you know fiction book that I had read, and so like I just I'm always listening and learning and, and envisioning and thinking of the things I want to do next and what I want to invest into next or what what piece of old farm equipment do I want to buy and fix up like that's. That stuff for me is really fun. I just bought it. What is it? A 1965 Ford X6 uh, F600. It's a two-ton pickup truck. This old, old truck with a 12-foot bed, and it's a it's a dump truck. Oh wow! And anyways, it needs a little bit of work on it, but you know, it's like to me, I just find tinkering with old, you know, old machines and fixing them up. Like to me, that's very, that's very enjoyable. I like working with my hands, and it also comes in handy. Like we you know, I I break a swather, and then you know, the dealer's like, it's five thousand dollars to fix it, and I'm like. Ooh, you know, I get the manual, take it all apart myself, and then I fixed it for, you know, like six, seven hundred dollars. Jeez. The biggest uh-huh. lesson I learned is don't break your equipment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like be careful, be as careful as you can. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a lot less, uh, I'm a lot more risk adverse when I'm, when I'm working on my fields or, you know, doing things. You know, I'm a lot more careful. And it's like sometimes, but that's, that's part of being a farmer. Like my dad, you know, he was mad at when it first happened, but he's just like, look, he's like, I've blown engines on cars. I have definitely broken my fair shares and machines as well. Like this is part of farming. This is part of learning. Oh yeah. You got to so, be a mechanic to be yeah. a good farmer these days, right? Yeah. And that's the thing is my dad was never a good mechanic. And so he always had to, you know, pay somebody to fix things. But you know, my dad's had hydraulic hoses and other things broken on his uh, tractors. And luckily I'm, you know, I'm able to, I go on the internet and I'm able to figure out most of the problems that he has. There's only every once in a while I'll have to take something to a dealer or take something, you know, a, piece of equipment somewhere else but most of the things i can fix myself which yeah, saves a lot of awesome. money yeah that's yeah. huge yeah this this farmer on the cover of our farm issue his name's thane taggy and yep. he was a accountant and he got to be about 41 years old and he's just like man i don't want to be an accountant for another 30 years and he bought a farm and he learned everything he, this japanese farmer could possibly teach him about farming. It was mostly how to use the implements on the tractor and fix the tractor and deal with all sorts of tractor problems. Yeah. And and he's a, he's a cool dude because he he's yeah. Taggy Farm has just blown up. He's all over the place. And yeah, that's the thing is I love I love hearing about people who have become first generation farmers. You know, like I've I've run the same land as my great great grandparents. You know, but somebody like him is a, you know a pioneer in his own sense. Yeah. And so yeah, that's why, it's... like, whenever I see anybody coming into farming, it's like bringing somebody in the fold. And just like for me, it's a, it's an exciting thing. It makes me happy. You know, other people enjoy farming, or other people are passionate about farming, like I am. Well, we'll take one more little break, and um, and I don't know how much time you have left, but I'd like to talk about how you believe the state can preserve more farms in Utah. That's kind of a big thing we cover in Utah Stories, and we'll get into that right when we get back. All right. Right. On this week's High Adventure Mountain Trails report, it is my running of the Wasatch Steeplechase. So this was the longest race I've ever run, most difficult by far. Um, I started training for it back in, in January, and I want to just share with you photos from the race and tell you my impressions of it. So um, this uh, first photograph is of the Capitol right at dawn when I arrived. It was 5 o'clock in the morning and uh, super early to wake up, and this was the uh, starting point. And then what we do, we start way down in City Creek Canyon, and if you know Salt Lake City, that's just like a mile from the heart of downtown Salt Lake, and then you just climb, climb 4,000 vertical feet up, straight up to the Wasatch front until you get all the way up to the Wasatch back. And uh, so these photos here, you can see what it looks like, from about um, from the top of Black Mountain, looking at the Wasatch back, and so we just kept climbing and climbing, and then the the wildflowers were just abundant and amazing. And then you get to a point where there's actually a drop off, a little cliff you have to drop off, and these people here are all like in line to drop off the cliff, and uh, 
and the whole time I'm getting like passed up by ladies. There was a lot of super strong ladies doing this race. And um, this particular view you can see here is, is the very top of the summit. And what, I, what happened to me on the way up, I was climbing and I think my adrenaline was rushing and I was just going as fast as I could. And, but then my calf muscle seized up. And um, luckily some dude had some salt tablets that he threw at me. And I took four salt tablets and like two minutes later, the uh, my calf muscle was working again. And that actually happened again on the way down. And then further on the way down, running as fast as I could, um, the padding on my feet started separating from my feet and it got extremely painful because um, I had not run downhill that much, especially in the mountains. I just tend to walk downhill. But I still managed to finish with a decent time, and um, it was just an amazing, fun race. And I, so what happens when you get in your 40s is you kind of get this idea of like you're, it's time to slow down. You're now on the other side of middle age, and your life's going downhill. And the reason why I'm doing these races now at this stage of my life is I think that we should all answer the call to adventure. We should all keep our lives interesting, challenge ourselves, both our bodies and our minds, because that's what keeps life fun. That's what keeps it interesting. And this whole idea that, you know, at middle age, you, you're going to have a midlife crisis and you're going to go possibly cheat on your wife or you got to go buy a, a sports car or get a divorce or whatever, that doesn't have to happen if you keep your life interesting and you basically take charge of making your life interesting. And so I highly recommend trail running, especially if you live near the mountains. It's the greatest thing I do in, t in terms of maintaining and keeping my balance in my life. So that's what this high country mountain report is going to be about. Um, every single week we're going to offer this on U the Utah Stories podcast. And you can subscribe to our Instagram and follow us, and I'll be posting more hikes and, and trails and races I do with my dogs. And that's about it. All right, we're back with uh, Lyle Christensen, the Viking farmer. And, and I really... Um, see this problem all over Utah all the time where several siblings are like second, third, fourth, fifth generation, and either one sibling's interested or even maybe a couple, but then the other siblings sort of feel like, well, why don't we just sell the farm, especially in Utah, because there's so much cash and equity in the land. It's the, it seems like to be the the biggest most difficult problem with multi generational farms. Do you did you guys find a solution to that problem or? <laughs> you know, it's funny because you say that because what what happens is a lot of kids don't ever want to farm, and then the parents either pretty much the parents don't want to let go of it, and they either hold on to it till they die, or they literally get to the point where like I cannot physically farm because I'm old and decrepit walking with the cane. Yeah, and then they they pretty much forced to sell and get rid of it. And so I've actually been, I've bought several pieces of farm equipment over the past year to uh, after the past you know in the past few years, where I bought from this old guy who was about the same age as my dad, and he's like, "What are you going to use this for?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm a farmer out in Spanish Fork," and explain to him what I do. You know, I'm an alfalfa farmer. I sell on Amazon and and all this other stuff. And he's like, "And he's like, you're a fifth generation farmer. He's you know like farm the same land as your ancestors." I'm like, yeah, that's that's me. And he's like, "Man, he's it's just like." I'm like, why are you selling this? And he's and he, and he tells me, well, none of my kids want a farm, and I'm getting too old. And you know, like this one guy in Orm, I bought this uh, uh, this mower from him to mow the weeds down at my farm, and he just had you know like a 10 acre orchard, and he's just like, none of my kids want a farm. I'm too old, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I pretty much got forced that I had to sell the land, and so I'm going to turn to subdivision now. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's happened to a lot of farmers, and. Uh, you know, it's funny because my C, the CEO of my company I'm at, he grew up on a farm in Idaho and he hated it. And I think it was mainly because, you know, his family didn't make very much. And a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, small farmers get taken advantage of or they don't make very much money in that. And they just realize it's, you know, a lot of kids realize like, man, there's got to be more to life than just living out on a farm and being dirt poor your whole life. Mm -hmm. And I think 
my parents also, you know, they, they encouraged me to get an education. They wanted me to leave Utah and do other things. But then over time, they were kind of like, oh, wait, we didn't think he was actually going to leave, you know. And they're like, you know, you should, you should come back to Utah, you know. Like, you should come work second crop hay with us. And whenever I'd come out there, they'd always, like, clean up the Dodge Diesel and everything for me. And I'd get to drive my dad's fancy truck all over town on the week I was here. And they, 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 they were trying to entice you back, enticing me to yeah. come back, so to speak. But I mean, they didn't have to do much. I, I was, I was pretty convinced on my own. But one thing that I, I found exciting is that you know my siblings who've had, uh, who've had little to no interest in farming, I've been talking to them about this opportunity, and now I, I have a sister in Alaska. Her and her husband, they're like, we want to become farmers too. We want to, we want to be part of the family business. And that's hmm. the thing is like you know getting one of these licenses would mean so much to my family because then it's it's bringing you know, the family back together, you know, I have family in, 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 uh, Alberta, in, uh, California, uh, in Alaska. Then I was in Massachusetts, you know, we're all five siblings are all in different States. And now I'm back and I'm farming. If, if I was to get one of these licenses, you know, my other, my siblings, you know, I have a sister who's a biomedical engineer, got her master's degree at UC Davis, which is one of the oh, best yeah. agricultural, you know, uh, mm-hmm. schools. And I'm just like, why is she not working with me? Why is she not doing this? She's a biomedic, biological engineer. We're making medicine. Yeah. We're making biology. Like this, is, this should be should something be for her to do, you know. Yeah. And so, uh, and that's it's great to see my parents are excited about this. And they, you know, my parents like they don't want to get rid of the farm, but they realize, you know, like time is ticking. And if it's like we don't make that much money farming, like what else are we gonna do? And so this is an avenue to bring the family back together to you know get everybody back into farming again you know that's like awesome get back to their roots and i was i'm the one who's who's done that but now it's like i can get my siblings involved and then it's like then it becomes like a family-run business i'm not the only person and it's like we can we can create wealth and and keep the farm going but it's like like i said earlier it's giving back to the community and that's something my family my family has done for so long and so you know i want to create a uh you know, the Ainer Christensen Foundation, you know, uh, after my, named after my great grandfather who was raised by the community. So, you know, I can create these scholarships for the youth and, and give back to the community that raised him. Yeah. Well, that's cool. That's, I think that's the number one argument and reason that we should keep this more local. It's like we're watching farms disappear. I mean, just since I started Utah Stories and we have our farm issue every year, it's like, half of the farms we've written about have disappeared. It's like yeah. they're the, the the kids just realize, man, this land is so much more valuable as being homes than it is being farmland. And so we have this just ongoing story about suburban sprawl and why not build not over farmland, but instead build more infill in the cities and let farmland stay farmland. But you know, I, I I can say the message is not getting out there. The state leaders do not understand the value of farmland. They just see an opportunity yeah. for more homes. And yeah, I agree with that. And that's the thing is, it's like, you know, I don't I don't think about the money. Like my parents' land that we have left, it's it's worth a lot of money. And our neighbors have sold land. I'm sure my parents could easily sell for millions of dollars, but they don't want to do it. And like, I don't. I don't want to sell. I want to keep that. Well, land it's like you. I, I, you know? it's... I mean, you're, you you got to if you think about your heritage, which you obviously yeah. spend a lot of time thinking about. Of course. Do you having a connection to the land is the is one of the most time honored traditional connections you can have, mm-hmm. and then or you know, and then these farmers that sell out, I I don't at all admonish them or 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 uh, disparage their decision. Yeah. But if your legacy can be, man, dad kept the farm in the family, dad kept their, or we're keeping that farming tradition alive, I just think that's maintaining your legacy better than any pile of money that the selling the farm could possibly do. Yeah, I agree, and that's I that's why my parents are so uh, they've they've been so supportive of this idea and what I want to do and how I want to give back to the community and and you know to keep the family farm alive, keep it viable. Yeah. And that's the thing is, it's like I, I, I've said earlier in the past that uh, necessity uh, is the catalyst for creativity. And that's where, you know, I'm not making very much money farming, selling alfalfa. And then I figure out I, I like to sell it on Amazon. And that's been that's been quite the process. That's not that's not farming there. And now that's like managing an online business, having the right keywords, using pay-per-click, 
uh, you know, having professional photos done, really differ differentiating your product from your competitors, and that's branding and marketing and all these other things. And so, well, just the shipping, I bet, is oh, yeah, logistically the There's a just big so challenge. much that goes yeah. into it that's not even you know farming related. But to me, it was exciting, and it's like now I've been able to create an avenue where I make much more per unit. I make much more for my product. And the thing is, it's I have a lot of customers who are getting, who they subscribe and save now. And so now I can kind of tell, like I can estimate my, what my demands is going to be over the next months because I get all these people who are now subscribing and buying every month. And so now I'm getting this, these bases of customers that keep growing and growing. That's awesome. And you know, it's, it's great to find people who value my product, who, uh, you know, like my, when I look at my reviews, it's never very, very few of them are just like, Oh, it's great. Hey, it's people are, taking pictures they are explaining like how green it is how it smells so fragrant how they're how they're you know their rabbits you know they get all antsy or whatever when they see it and they get all excited and to me like that's that's very rewarding as well finding people who see uh alfalfa and see farming the same way the same way i do people mm -hmm. who notice that i take all that extra time to make a, a superior product and you know in the in the world of f-150s i'm creating a lamborghini you know yeah. it's that's that's the that's the kind of thing. Instead of making a bunch of cars and having you know the you know Ford makes way more money than Lamborghini does, but per unit Lamborghini is they've they've got a niche product that that people are loyal to and that that is per high performance. And so that's what I've been able to do with my alfalfa. And I I think that I, so this is kind of what we promote so much in the magazine. It's like the idea of knowing where your food comes from really empowers both you and makes you really appreciate the farmers around you because if you know how your peaches were grown um, up in Brigham City and what that farmer put into manicuring and taking care of those peaches and, and fertilizing his fields, that peach is going to have a lot more value to you than the peaches that you buy at Walmart that are coming probably from Mexico and you know the sweet juicy delicious flavor when when peaches are in season becomes so much more valuable to consumers than the commodity product and so it's like i think we're kind of going through this phase right now where we're seeing farm products be, become decommoditized where alfalfa it's probably traded by the ton on the futures market i would guess oh yeah and you're nowhere near that pricing. Is that is that right? Oh yeah, that's that's it's a totally different game. I'm a totally different ball game I'm playing. But it's like going back on the peach, it's funny you say that because I have a neighbor who's a peach farmer and he has the best peaches and we always buy boxes of boxes. What was it? A couple of years ago I made about fifty quarts of uh, peaches. Oh, and wow. so I, I like to can and make foods as well. Cool. And my parents, my grandma and my mother have taught me how to do that. And so that's whenever that's I think, whenever I think peaches from the spirit. farmer, you know, that's like, that's my, uh, that's my neighbor. He, he makes the, the best peaches and I always make, uh, you know, I always, I always can peaches afterwards or we'll slice them up and dehydrate them. And then it's like, you can have those throughout the year. You ration them out and, and then now, now we're getting pretty low on them. And so now like, okay, this year we're going to be, we're going to be canning a bunch of peaches again. And nice. it's great because for me, it's like a family experience. My grandma gets to come and she helps work on it a little bit. My mom helps as well. And then my sister's kids, I, I show them how things work. Like th some of the most rewarding things for me, uh, a few weeks ago, I took my sister's kids out to the farm to show them how, what a plowed field looks like, what a disc looks like. And I let them jump on the tractor with me and we drive it around in a circle. I let them sit on my lap, you know, and I let them take the wheel for a second, you know, and they find that really enjoyable. And then I show them how... I, I planted some oats, uh, and I show them how the grain drill works. I'm like, okay, this is where we, we got to put the oats in here. Okay, you see where they're coming out of those little holes right there? You see how – and then you get out there, and I, I bring up the dirt. And I'm like, see the seeds? Now they're in the dirt. They've been sowed in there, and cool. now it's going to grow. And it's like teaching little kids like that. They get super excited about it. And so that's been yeah. really fun to see, you know, the sixth generation in our family learning to be farmers. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, well, we didn't get into the whole um, what made cannabis become illegal in the first place bit, but maybe we could save that for the next time. Yeah. You probably got to get going, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, we so. got some. I got some things I got to do. I got some more analyses I've got to do today and uh, a few more JIRA tickets, and then I've got to go to work, and uh, or I got to go to the farm after that. I got to start baling hay. Yeah, that's that's uh, a I busy gotta, day. I got to water my hemp plants. So yeah, well, thanks so much for coming on, Lyle. I yeah. really appreciate it. I, yeah, well, thank you for inviting me over here. I hope we can uh, meet up again and, and do another one of these. Yeah, definitely. 
All right. Thanks for watching the Utah Story Show. This has been Richard Marcosian. If you want to support the show, you can do so in one of three ways. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and thumbs up this show. That helps us a lot. I also love comments if you're on YouTube. If you're on iTunes or another uh, podcast platform, thumbs up the program, leave us a review. That's always very helpful. And last but not least, you can become a member of Utah Stories and Made in Utah for just $9.99 a month or $99 for the entire year. And for a limited time, we are offering a free $50 VIP ticket to our upcoming Made in Utah Festival. If you have not come to one of our festivals, they are awesome. They sell out. The VIP sections always sell out. And we want to give the people who want to support our show and our content um, an opportunity to come and enjoy the VIP experience by becoming a member. So with your $99 for the entire year um, contribution, you will be plugged in to all of our best content. You'll help to chime in on what we're doing, and you'll be informed about all our upcoming events, and you will have first dibs on VIP tickets. So with that, I will see you next time. This has been Richard Marcosian. Thanks for watching.